Hey guys, welcome back. Chris here with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another gun store vlog. Today we're going to talk about the hysteria around the pistol brace rule that was imposed by the ATF about a week or so ago. I want to talk about some misconceptions I am hearing out there as well as give some things to think about. So if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up now. So for those of you living under a rock, about a week to a week and a half ago, the ETF came out with a new rule in regards to the usage of pistol braces. They stated that you could no longer have a pistol brace mounted onto your pistol, lest it be considered an SBR and fall under the purview of the NFA. Now this is them backpedaling on almost a decade of uh, decisions and rules that they had come out with in the uh, affirmative for the use of arm braces or pistol braces on pistols, deeming that it was legal to have them mounted on your pistol and they could be shouldered. Now, of course, as mentioned, they are going back on this and they are retroactively stating that any pistol that has a pistol brace on it is an SBR, and they were SBRs dating back to the time that they were manufactured. Now, you can keep and maintain your pistol brace, it just cannot be mounted onto a pistol without registering it as an SBR. So that is basically the gist of it. I came out with a very short video right when this was released. I had some information in it that was wrong. I now have had time to look over the rule I want to clarify some things as well as some other misconceptions I am hearing from other people out there in the market. And then we'll sort of talk about some broader scope takeaways from this and some things for you guys to think about. So first and foremost, the biggest thing to remember here is that this has not been put into the federal register. This rule has no effect on anybody or anything until it is in the federal register. As of the time of filming this video, it is not in the federal register. That could change by the time this video is uploaded and published but right now it is not. Now, when this rule was first released, it was basically a 200 and some odd page draft of what the pistol brace rule is going to say. Things can be changed, things can be removed, things can be added before it's put into the federal register, but it is not there yet. Therefore, right now, the legality of pistol braced pistols has not changed or is no different than it was a year ago. But any day now, this will go into the register. When it does, this goes into effect. The second misconception I'm seeing is the 88 day rule. Now this has been circulating and a lot of other content creators has, have already rebuffed this and rightly so. So first of all, we're talking about one of the things that can be done to fix the problem of you being in, in, in non-compliance with this new rule is if you have a pistol with a brace on it, the ATF is deeming that that is an SBR, a short barreled rifle, which is controlled by the NFA. Now, historically speaking, if you wanted an SBR, you could either purchase one completely assembled that would transfer to you on a tax paid form four, or you could convert your, uh, your you know, already pistol and to a rifle by putting a stock on it. But first, you would have to send in a Form 1 application that is an application to remanufacture a firearm into an NFA item. Also comes with a $200 tax. Historically, these have taken about three to six months to approve. Form 4s have taken about a year to 14 months or so to approve. But you would have to go either route in order to have a genuine SBR. Now, with this new rule, the ATF is saying that they are going to give a 120-day grace period for people to convert their pistol brace pistols into SBRs. Now, some people have stipulated that this is going to be a trap, that the ATF can't possibly get these applications all completed, and we'll talk about the implications of that as well. But they can't possibly get all these applications processed in 120 days. And people have said that the form or the form one application expires in 88 days and when it expires it's automatically denied and therefore you're being denied on a form one application of an SBR you already have and have provided photo evidence of and that's something uh, too that with the conversion of a pistol brace pistol into a uh, SBR you have to send photo evidence of the completed firearm thus giving the ATF evidence that you've created or committed a felony they know where you live because of the applications and they've denied you. Now that is not entirely true. The 88 day uh, expiration date is when uh, information is purged from the 4473 NIC system. That is on a 4473 over the counter background check you complete on a Title I firearm. That is things like locks and AR-15s and anything that you just can go into a gun store and buy over the counter. 
Now the system does purge that information after 90 days. Uh, that was reduced to 88 days for some reason by the, uh, by the FBI uh, for when they purge that information. That does not apply to Form 1 and Form 4s. I have gone through many Form 1 and many Form 4 applications with my customers and I will tell you that not a single one has ever been processed in 88 days. Uh, like I said, Form 4s, I've had a customer that took almost two years to go through a Form 4, but his application never expired. We did not have to resubmit it. Uh, Form 1s, we've had customers report, you know, at the earliest three months is like the, the quickest I've ever heard of a Form 1 going through. Um, so, you know, about 90 days or so. Uh, so that could, in, in that regard, fit into that time crunch. But by most cases, they're about five to eight months or so in a Form 1. Uh, this gets into a little bit, this is something to think about, and I had done the math on this. If you take uh, what is estimated to be currently 10 to 40 million pistol braces out there on the market today, if we take the lower end of that, which is 10 million, and you, you assume 10 million pistol braces are out there and people submit them, that's what the ATF wants people to do is to submit them to be converted into an SBR, that's 10 million applications. Let's say a background check on average takes about 15 minutes. Uh, when we run background checks in our store, it's about 10 to 20 minutes, so let's say an average of 15 minutes. Keep in mind, your year-long waiting period, it doesn't take them a year to run your background check. It takes them a year to get to your background check because they have you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of applications ahead of yours by the time you submit yours for review. But anyway, um, if you uh, take just 15 minutes to process an application and you take a one person that works a 40 hour work week not accounting for lunch breaks or vacations, it would take that one person roughly 1400 years to process all of those applications. And I did all this math before and I'm trying to go off of memory. If you then try to get that down to one year, you're looking at about 1400 agents to to be working full time 40 hours a week, no vacations, to process all of those applications in one year. The current, as of 2019, ATF role on their agents was about 1,700 agents, which means it would take about 80% of the ATF's current workforce if they were all dedicated to processing these forms. It would take them one year to get all of these forms processed. Now, that's for 10 million. If we assume 40 million, then you have to quadruple that number. Or if they're not adding new agents, that's saying taking 80% of their workforce and redirecting them to processing this, then we have 80% of the ATF working on registering uh, pistol braced handguns, which effectively are not being used really at all in crime. There's a couple instances out there in a country of 350 million people. Um, rather than out there looking for gangs or drug cartels or human traffickers or anything like that. So uh, that is the implication here. Uh, so not at all a feasible task and a little bit misguided in terms of where resources could be directed. The other thing I'm hearing a lot about is 922R and if it is an imported pistol, it should be destroyed. That could give some insight into how the ATF is going to be sort of looking at 922R. If we consider how this rulemaking has been traveling. A lot of uh, you know politicians have been giving a lot more power to bureaucracies lately to come up with these rules so they don't have to be beholden to the changes in legislation and the votes that they make. It's just a way for them to cop out of being held responsible for anything. That's our politicians for you. Uh, this is what we're left with. And anything that they can do, the bureaucrats, to uh, shoehorn these new rules and, and regulations into effect, they will do that. So is this insight into how 922R can be shoehorned into banning yet another subset of guns. Now this segues me into an important point that I would like to make in regards to this and to head off this point I'm going to read prose from a German Lutheran pastor named Martin Niemöller who wrote this as part of a post-war confessional after World War II in 1946. Um, and reading this it, it, it reads, uh, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Okay, first of all, I want to be very clear. I'm not making a comparison between the, the tremendous loss of life and the Holocaust and what is happening now in contemporary American politics with pistol braces. That is not at all what I am pointing out here. I'm looking at instead the methodology that is being addressed. It is when the silence of a population happens, it allows for way to lead on to way, which can inevitably lead to the strengthening or the progression of a movement that is that is not entirely good. 
And if it's not affecting you now, just wait and it will affect you in the future. And by the time it does affect you, all the people who came before you may not be around or may not be willing to help you when it does. And that's the general consensus that I'm taking out of these pros by Martin Niemöller. And I'm going to sort of, to address this point, I will rephrase it in terms of the pistol brace uh, rule that we're looking at. And I could say, first they came for the bump stocks, but I did not speak out because I did not own a bump stock. Then they came for the pistol braces, and I did not speak out because I did not own a pistol brace. Then they came for imported pistols, and I did not speak out because I didn't own an imported pistol. Then they came for standard capacity magazines, and I did not speak out because I did not have a standard capacity magazine. But then they came for my shotgun, and I did speak out. But by then the ATF had a mountain of legal precedent that I could do nothing. That's sort of the thing here. So I've seen in the comment section of my previous video, as well as videos put out by others, is, hey guys, this is clearly just a workaround for stocks. I mean, this is these were just workarounds to get around the SBR laws, and these braces are just uncomfortable stocks, and yada, 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 yada. I can't fully disagree with that sentiment. Okay, guys, to be totally fair, I own a gun store. These things have been in circulation since I've been in business. And I have never once had a person come in and purchase a pistol brace pistol because they have a disability. I'm not saying that there aren't people out there like that and those people should be able to shoot firearms more comfortably and we should look out for people in our society who have disabilities, especially when it comes to veterans and, and things like that. Totally on board with that, but by and large, let's be fair, most people are using these as shouldering implements, okay? They're using them to shoulder and better control the pistols, which I think is actually a better thing. Having good controllability over your firearm makes a whole lot of sense to me. So in my opinion, whether it's a stock or not a stock or a workaround to an SBR or not a workaround to an SBR is not the point. The point is, is the ATF came out in 2012 and said these were okay. Businesses were built, products were manufactured, and millions and millions of these were sold to people who were buying them in good faith as legal. What this rule does is without executive action, without Congress you know, voting, or without any type of legislation, these are not only being banned from its intended use, but banned from its intended use retroactively. Now, this is coming off of what happened with the bump stocks. Now, the bump stocks were, you know, made for Bolton under the exact same implications. I said it at that time that that was creating a very bad uh, legal precedent. It was opening the door for future things like that to happen. And of course, here we are. Now, if we let this happen again, what is not to stop them from saying, you know, we said back in the 80s that it was okay to have AKs and ARs, but now we're going to go ahead and change our mind on that and retroactively ban them. We said it was okay to have 30 round plus magazines, but we've changed our minds, so we're retroactively banning them. You know, that is the problem here, and that doesn't only extend to firearms. That can be anything that you own. I know I'm being a little bit uh, fatalistic here, but this is, the, I mean, this is the type of thing that this opens everybody up to. So if you don't want, you know, in every step that they take, every new thing that's banned gets them more and more legal precedent, more and more okay for them to move on to the next thing, and they will. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's just the argument, argument I'm making here. You can agree or disagree. Finally, guys, some clarification on this rule. What are some ways that you can comply with the rule should you choose to do so? And I'm not here to tell you what to do. Uh, one thing that I had stated in my previous video is you could simply take the brace off when we're talking about AR-15s and then you're good to go. That was incorrect. Uh, you would have to modify the buffer tube or put a pistol type a buffer tube that does not have the notches or, or a way to re to quickly reconfigure that brace back onto the firearm. So lowers or pistols with buffer tubes, the way that they were made, you know, back in 2008, for example, that would be okay under my interpretation of this rule. Uh, if it's notched like a carbine buffer tube that can quickly take a stock or a brace, uh, you cannot do that. Um, you could put a 16 inch upper onto your uh, pistol lower and that would now make it not a pistol and therefore not regulatable uh, by this new rule. You could file it under a form one under the 120 day grace period that the ATF is allotting. Keep in mind, you do have to follow all NFA rules with that firearm once it, it has been converted. 
which means you cannot leave the state with it unless you file, believe it is the form five, the application to notify the ATF that you are leaving the state with the firearm. Cannot be readily accessible to people in your home unless they're on a trust, uh, uh, you know, who have legal right to be able to, to take possession of that in your absence. Uh, like you couldn't hang it on your wall if you live at home with, you know, your 18 year old son and your wife, you can't have it accessible to them. You go out to the store uh, to get groceries and it's easily accessible by either one of them and it's not on a trust, it's directly in your name. Technically, they could be in violation. They could be in possession of an unregistered SBR. There's a whole lot of implications there. Again, talk with your attorney about all the ins and outs of that. Um, so there's that to consider. So there's a lot of implications when you go down the SBR route. Uh, they are waiving the $200 tax fee for the first 120 days. If it takes you longer than 120 days and you will, will have to pay $120, um, you will have to pay $200 in taxes to register that as an SBR. Uh, so those are really the different routes that you can go to fall into conformity with this. Again, as of today, the day I'm filming this, uh, this is not in the register. So you don't really have to do anything right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, when this goes into effect, I uh, presume that this will be challenged. Um, and, you know, you might want to, to kind of hang out and see what happens with that. A lot of people are using the Fifth Circuit uh, challenge on the bump stock ban as a basis for why this is DOA. Uh, the bump stock has not been made legal yet. It has just been challenged in the Fifth Circuit. Uh, it would have to make its way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court would have to hear the case and it would have to be overturned by the Supreme Court in order for bump stocks to become legal again. I hope that that happens because if that sets legal precedent that these rules that the ATF are making are overreaching, then that will make anything like this in the future very difficult for them to to go along with. If the bump stock rule change is upheld by the Supreme Court, however, that will justify the fact that the ATF does have the ability to interpret uh, laws and create new rules, and that could make this uh, brace rule uh, much more, uh, have much more potency to it. It could also pave the way for future rules like it to happen to other products in the future. So please be careful and think about that as well. Anyway, guys, those are my thoughts on this issue. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. I'm going to leave you guys off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.